Good, good morning. Um, I'd like to tell the story. Um, I've told this story many times before, but I, so bear with me if you've heard it, and forgive me. Um, but I want to mention it primarily because I believe these individuals, including to some extent Mary Prince, were the architects of the world that would, te would develop after 1834. These individuals, 38 individuals, will be the ones who I'll talk about. So I'll begin with them. On the 13th of January, 1834, a group of, of, in Bermuda, a group of free colored and free black men, as they were called, um, are met to put together a petition. And the petition basically stated this. That it was called the Petition for the Further Amelioration of Their Condition. The, what was happening at the moment was that there was a beginning to start the debate over, well, over the emancipation of slavery that began in 1833. The, the British had sent, um, had sent a bill for all the, the colonies to amend, as it was their practice, and they were about to construct this new uh, system, abolition society that was gonna happen post-1834. These men suddenly got, aware, got, suddenly got concerned about this because they feared, understandably, that what they'll get was something that was gonna look a whole lot like what they had before. So they decided to meet and put together the petition. They were a strange array of people. They included a planter, they included a branch pilot, they included uh, um, a clerk, and they also included one of the wealthiest black men in Bermuda, a shipbuilder by the name of James Attle. Um, by the time this bill came, their purpose was to ensure that Bermuda's legislation would in fact reflect their concerns and particularly would concern, would be deal with the problem of civil disabilities that were, were systematically placed on the basis of race. My purpose here is to, dis, is to set the context and the character for this particular style of activism the context in which there was a demographic revolution that occurred in Bermuda roughly around the same time, but also to place this in the large international context for which this occurred. We have to, what is never given or never seen as part of the context has been the, um, what we call, what uh, uh, some writers have called the humanitarian revolution. And I would like to show and discuss its, this event and its application to Bermuda. Let me explain, first of all, what I mean by the humanitarian revolution on my day. Am I good? Thank you. Um, the great historian Franklin Wright once noted that the American Revolution was a struggle for civil and political rights. But then he said, and this is significant, that what would occur in the Caribbean, that would occur in what we call San Domingue. I will call it San Domingue until it becomes Haiti in 1804. Um, what happened in those was that we moved from the, the conflict for civil rights to the conflict for human rights, as Dr. Jarvis had mentioned. And that was the fundamental shift that would occur as a result of the struggle that was occurring in the Caribbean, as well as in Latin America, which would be pushed forward by people like Miguel Hidalgo in Mexico and Simón Bolívar in Venezuela. The human rights struggle would therefore have two components that the great historian and my ment my um, uh, my uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Inspiration. Hero. There we go. Um, <laughs> uh, um, the great Edward Brathwaite once called the humanitarian revolution, and which he said it was he called it the struggle for the international the Atl international Atlantic struggle for the abolition of slavery, the push for for by blacks particularly for religious education, because they believe, and they've been believing this from the 1600s, that education was the tool for their emancipation. And more important, most important, sorry, the push for the removal of civil disabilities based on race. That's the addition that is, the two I'm gonna focus on will be the push against, for the push for abolition and the push against civil disabilities based on race. As I said, the inspiration for this was occurring in a place we never would expect it, and that is the French Revolution, the French Revolution in Saint-Domingue, the Saint slave uprising, which I believe is distinctly different from what would be called the Haitian Revolution that would begin in 1803 and 1804. Why do I mention these? Because both, all these, these things set forth two, thi two most important elements. One, the push for civil liberties. By the time that revolution was finished, it had, had constructed a, a regime in which civil liberties would be spread throughout the, throughout the French Empire. Slavery ended in 1794, partly because of the insurgency carried out by blacks in saint -Domain. Let me repeat that point. Partly because of the insurgency that blacks carried out 
in the island of Sandamé. That was their condition. We will support the revolution if and only if this, there is a um, movement toward the abolition of slavery and the, in, and the increasing of civil rights. Fast forward, what does that have to do, you're probably saying, with Bermuda? Because they were watching this. How do we know this? The record says it. Um, Henry Hamilton complained that the blacks were constantly in contact with people in the Caribbean and were in, the, in the islands in resistance. Andrew Durnford complained that there was a manifest behavioral change among black people in Bermuda. Um, Bridget Goodrich complained along with them, the same petition, saying that there was a manifest change in their behavior. Why? Because they were reading the same newspapers that everybody else was reading. And, that, and those newspapers were filled with stories of Toussaint Louverture blasting his way across, the, across Saint-Domingue, as well as other events. Demographic events occurring at the same time. In 1806, we see the end for the first time, for most of um, Bermuda's history, as Dr. Jarvis has mentioned, Bermuda was in fact dominated, it was a white numerical domination. And my, my, my other mentor, Elaine Foreman Crane, makes the point, it was a female majority domination. By 1806, that changed. From 1806, it went from a white domin numerical domination to a black numerical domination. And that was both seen as well as, was, was quantified as well as seen. Just a small point, um, the white population was 4,798. In 1806, the black population had become 5,240. It had dwarfed it, not dwarfed it, it just passed it, by 542 people. <laughs> by the time they're talking about abolition, the black population was 4,898. The, um, the white population was 4,297. That's the context for discussing the abolition of slavery because it became very, very clear from that point forward that it was going to be now a society in which blacks were numerically dominant. What I like to call the, 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 the white area of art had come to an end in 1806 in terms of numerical domination. And more to the point, the black, free black population had now reached 7% and was going to reach 12% by the end, by 1833. That led to the political activism, which I'll summarize in two sets. That was petitionism to which the, the, the narrative of Mary Prince must be seen. It was, in fact, a very large petition against slavery. She would became herself a free black, and therefore that was her petition, and of course the petition I mentioned by these 38 black, black men. Both of them, one ended slavery, became part of the discourse for the ending of slavery, the other became part of the discourse for the ending of abolition. What did they ask for? They asked simply for the removal of civil disabilities placed on race. What did they get? Abolition Act 1 and Abolition Act 2. Abolition Act 1 would end slavery, as Mary Prince so eloquently put it up, till all, till, uh, slavery would be done up forevermore. But Abolition Act 2 would be the, for the first time establishing and putting into place systems that were eradicated race-based race race -based, um, race uh, systems of segregation. So while well, you're probably asking, Bermuda still became segregated. What happened? It moved from the public sphere, from, from the public square to the private sphere. From this point forward, racism would be privatized. Understand the condition of that, because what that would mean that education, which should have been a public system, would have to become private in order for it to be segregated. That meant large numbers of people would not be able to have access to it because they'll have to pay for it. At a time when movements around the world were moving toward public, much, much they were moving toward public education available to all. Also, last but not least, I'll make this one last point. There was a um, black activism took on a different role. Instead of just being, instead of, it would become one in which they would bring in allies in support for their cause. And that would become the methodology that would dominate from the rest of the period. As I said, what they got from it was quite simple. To a large extent, the men got what they wanted. Mary Prince certainly got what she wanted. Slavery was done up forevermore, she eloquently stated. Um, I know what a slave is. I know how a slave feels. And I want all people in England to know it too, so um, they, may, they break our chains and set us free. That was her statement. I memorized it. Um, <laughs> but, but for the most part, it, of course, this group of men excluded women. That's another thing that, <laughs> um, but whatever, and therefore the issue of female suffrage never showed up in what they got. What they got 
However, but having said that, and I'll conclude on this point, what they got was an abolition, a post-abolition society according to the petition that they had asked for. They are, in many ways, the ex they're both of them, Mary Prince on one side, these 38 men on the other, are the architects of the post-abolition society as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.